Hello and thanks for joining us. Coming up on today's show. Joining the big leagues, designer Julien Fournier is now a permanent member of France's Haute Couture Club. Our reporters met with him in the days before he presented his latest collection. Trainspotting 2 is hitting screens two decades after the first one became a cult classic. The set is back in full, including the original actors who say they were as skeptical about making a sequel as the film's fans. And leaving his mark on the world of street art, Latlas is getting his first indoor solo show. His work graces walls in cities around the globe. From guest to member of France's most prestigious fashion club, Scaparelli and Julien Fournier have joined the ranks of the select haute couture circle that includes iconic houses like Dior and Givenchy. They're showing their collections during haute couture week, taking place as we speak. Our reporters Laure Manin, Noredine Bézieux and Nick Rushworth met with Julien Fournier in the final moments before his designs hit the catwalk. The pressure is mounting with masses of sewing to be done, but the mood is relaxed. 38 designs have been ready for days, some for months. These are the finishing touches. It's this length, then goes 10 centimeters shorter. Let's say 8 centimeters. So when the model turns, we won't see at the back. Julien Fournier's first runway show as a permanent member of the French haute couture chambre syndicale is called First Kinetics. The stress is on an array of stunning colors. I exaggerate an ultra-feminine look, focusing on the woman's body shape, the hips and body length. Obsessing on height, her stance, a woman's greatness is in the stance. This collection is a cry for freedom, which I feel is what haute couture is all about. Fournier says he was inspired by the 60s for this collection. Some designs are associated with artists popular at the time. This one is a nod to the work of Jackson Pollock. And the dress here, he says, is a tribute to Alexander Calder's mobiles. I'm using rhodoid plastic, materials I consider innovative. Things are piled up very much in the style of the artist Raymond Moretti. It's in the style of Moretti, an interpretation, because I don't want to copy as such. That doesn't interest me. What I love about this artist is that he was the first to do organic forms and geometric shapes. He used 2D to create the impression of 3D. Fournier innovates with materials and techniques. One design reflects his love of sequins. Here he swipes to show the effect. Part of Fournier's distinct style can also be seen in his choice of models. He chose black female models when he was a guest of the Haute Couture Club in 2011, and this time around he used models from around the world. An architectural gem reopens its doors. Here in Paris, the Richelieu Louvois National Library started welcoming the public again after a six-year restoration project. The historic building holds innumerable precious manuscripts for the delight of scholars and visitors alike. Radaba Abbas has more. A temple of knowledge lies in the heart of the French capital. The Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris has been injected with a new lease of life. At the heart of the building is the Byzantine-inspired Le Brust Room. The oval room was designed by the French architect Jean-Louis Pascal in 1897. Nine cupolas adorned the ceiling with 36 medallions bearing the names of great French writers. For more than a century, readers have sought refuge here and it continues to attract students and writers alike. As I spend most of my time at the library, it's important for it to feel like home or to be in a place as beautiful as this. Among its nine reading rooms is a new space bathed in light, the Library of the Arts. 
was surprised at the change. Uh, it's a very peaceful place now. It's up to date, totally different from the way it was before. But the Gallery Auguste Rondel, which includes 400,000 works, still remains closed to the public. The Department of Manuscripts houses the greatest works of French history, including the original version of J'accuse, written by Emile Zola in 1898. Zola's writing is well known, and it's clear that the version of this letter has been revised many times. It's evident because you can see the corrections. There may have been some earlier rough drafts. It's a letter that corresponds to a real work of thought, a real work of writing meant to convince. The library has also unveiled new sections to the public, including this gallery, which was a former storage area. What's magical here is that readers can sit and read among the books, in the midst of these structures of cast iron and wood that contribute to the atmosphere of this place. The magnificent oval room is still undergoing restoration. A fundraising initiative has been launched to finance the project. The library will turn a new page in its history when the room reopens to the public in three years. 21 years ago, train spotting became an instant cult classic with the story of drugs, sex, and poverty in Edinburgh. The story follows a group of heroin addicts as they try to kick their habit. Now, the original cast is back, and so is director Danny Boyle for Train Spotting 2, and they don't want to disappoint. <laughs> I think we all were a little nervous about making a sequel to Trainspotting and not pulling it off and damaging the reputation or leaving a sort of stale taste in people's mouths about the original film. To come back and do the film felt like a real, uh, it felt like a duty to begin with. Like we thought, we're real responsibility. Because for all of us, I think, this town, these stories have been fundamental in shaping our careers. Leaving his mark on the world of street art, Latlas is one of the handful of street artists who's made it in the art world, commanding, uh, commanding same prices as established contemporary artists. His work draws inspiration from a mix of Arabic geometric patterns and the Latin alphabet. Radaba Abbas takes a closer look. Whether it's France, China or Africa, the work certainly leaves an impression. Using concrete settings as his canvas, Latlas is making his mark and people are noticing. I quickly realized that given the number of people who were active on the streets that I had to find my own style to win them over. Latlas belongs to the second generation of street art. He made his graffiti debut in the early 90s at the ripe age of just 11. Now, at 39, he has created a distinctive signature style of his own, which is instantly recognizable. Using bold stripes, Latlas frames maze-like patterns that draw the viewer into his world. Fusing Arabic Kufic calligraphy and phantasmagoric forms, his work carves a mesmerizing universe. La répétition de lignes. The repetition of lines, diagonals or corners creates optical effects that create a retinal vibration in the eye which hypnotizes people. The work of La Atlas is strong because he has found his own visual identity, a signature. And that's one of the key principles of street art. You don't imitate. You have to find your own identity and style. Latlas has garnered respect in the competitive street art market and is gaining in popularity as galleries continue to showcase his work. A painting like this, two meters by two, is worth 15,000 euros. Ten years ago, it was worth around 2,000. The world of fashion has also embraced Latlas, as more and more luxury brands align themselves with trendy contemporary artists to boost their image. It's a pleasure to receive such recognition. 
His first solo show, Imperial Letters, is currently at the Maison Guerlain on the Champs Elysees until the 28th of February. And that's it for this edition of Encore. Thank you for watching. You can find us on our website. We're also on Twitter and Facebook. In just a moment, there's more news coming up on France 24. We leave you with these photos from the Circulations Festival that's taking place at the 104 Center here in Paris. The festival is on until March 5th and features young European photographers. Visited, presented by Stuart Norville. In Zimbabwe, land reform in the early 2000s led to a dramatic drop in food production. The result was a food shortage, while prices reached record highs in 2008 with a hyperinflation of 80 billion percent. Today, Zimbabweans are skeptical about new measures to improve the economic situation. They've tried to challenge them, but every form of protest is systematically repressed by Mugabe's government a pariah of the international community. Revisited on France 24 and France24.com.